Well, good morning. Thank you guys so much for joining us at Renew Church. And for those watching online, if you would stand and sing with us this morning. <laughs>
nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come, and the 
consume our thoughts, consume our, our, our space right now. Um, and so God, we're just asking your Holy Spirit just to remove those distractions in our life, remove those things that are holding us back to fully seek you in this moment. God, I pray uh, as your word goes out that it just connects with our spirit and our spirit connect with you. Father, we love you and we thank you. And in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I am so uh, excited and thankful uh, to be here with you guys this morning. I know God is going to do an amazing thing, and um, I'm excited to announce and share with you that uh, one of my closest friends and um, a couple and people who have been so encouraging to Ashley and I, so supportive, um, and, and their love for us, 
Um, Mark is going to share God's word this morning. And so I'm excited to hear what God has to say. Um, I'm excited and thankful for them and for their, their relationship. Uh, is a relationship that, uh, that Ashley and I look up to, that we want to model. Um, their hard work and their just their commitment to Jesus um, has been such a blessing to see and watch over these last uh, almost eight years that we've known you guys. And so thank you guys so much for all you do. And Mark, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing God's word and what God has for your heart on your heart this morning. And so would you guys welcome uh, Mark to open up the word. I definitely appreciate that. You know, uh, I'll get this out of the way first, and there's probably a joke that could be said behind it, but what's important to me is, and one of the most humbling and honorary things somebody could do for me is to trust me with their pulpit. Now, I, I take this as an honor greater than if the president would call from the White House. You can leave that where it is, <laughs> depending on which way you go. But still, it is a great honor. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. And it doesn't go unnoticed. Or and I, I just appreciate it. Uh, that he has that trust in me. Uh, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and you're not suffering from Thanksgiving hangover. Which, uh, I've got some of that right here. But anyway, but I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful we live in a nation that we do. And I would like to say on behalf of Thanksgiving, I appreciate my wife. I'm thankful for her. She is a great help me. She's wonderful and loving and kind and sweet, the most beautiful woman on earth, and I love her. So I'm thankful for that. So anyway, today what I want to talk about is, is impossible situations. Now, impossible situations is not the dog is sick or the vacuum cleaner broke down or anything like that. My car won't start. Sometimes impossible situations are something that happens to us in life that shakes us to our very core, that brings us down and, and makes us sometimes we even wonder about our faith. That sometimes we even think about what in the world am I going to do? Uh, in Luke 18 and 27, he said, and the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, in the Greek, impossible in this circumstance, when Jesus is speaking with the disciples, it's something that is completely hopeless that you've given up on. It's impossible. It shakes you to your very core. It's impossible. But he said those things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And that word refers directly out of the Greek as powerfully Capable, Because we serve a God that is powerfully capable. He's able to do anything. Now, when I think about an impossible situation, uh, I shared with Mike a little bit the other day. I used to uh, go to nursing homes and speak at nursing homes. And, and uh, I developed a close relationship with an elderly black man there. And we got to be very good friends. And he was had diabetes. And I watched as they took his feet off his legs, and he got down to where all he had was an arm. And uh, it touched me at the time, and I felt like this is hopeless. And so I was talking to him one day, and we were sitting there, and he said, you think it's over, don't you? And I said, yeah, and he got me by the hand, and he said, oh no, this is not hopeless. He said, I've got a promise. He said, one day I'm going to have new legs. Amen. He said, I'm going to have new feet, new arms, a new body. And he said, and we'll meet each other in heaven and we'll rejoice forevermore. He said, it is not hopeless. Not as long as it is possible with God. Now, even though he was facing death, and he knew that, still he knew that he had hope with God. That one day, one day he'd be whole again. That's the way we have to look at things sometimes. We have to know that God is possible. God is capable. God can do these things. 
Now in 2 Chronicles 21, and I'm going to try to make this short. It might go a couple, three hours. I don't know. I know some of y'all have ball games at 1 o'clock. My team don't play till tomorrow night. And, uh, so I could go the rest of the day, but I hope not. I, I was kind of chuckling to Tanya there. She gave me a mint. It reminded me of a story of a, a pastor that every time he spoke, he put a mint in his mouth, and when it dissolved, he quit. That way he knew his message was the right length. One morning, he went like two hours, and the deacons asked him, so what happened? He said, well, I put my hand in the pocket, and he said, instead of a mint, I found a button. And he said, I put the button in my mouth, and he just kept preaching. So I don't have any buttons in my mouth this morning. <laughs> Second Chronicles 21 says, and it came to pass after this, and I'm sorry, I'm just all being King James. I grew up with King James, and I just, I just like the language of it. It says that the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, with them, other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Now, first, I'd like to say, these were mortal enemies of the Jews. Now, we have to put ourselves in this time. It's not like they had a disagreement or anything. But these folks literally hated the Jews. Now, this is something we don't see much in the United States. But if you would go over overseas and you would go into the, some of the Middle Eastern countries, they still war over there and hate each other with a passion. They still do that over there. And I'm sure we probably see a fraction of it in the United States. But over there especially, my brother was in the Air Force and he said when he was stationed in Italy, he said uh, they also had Israeli fighters there. And he said every morning the Israeli fighters would go out and they would lean on their airplanes and face Jerusalem and say, God, please let us go destroy our enemies. They wanted to fight so badly and to wipe out their enemies. So you have to realize here when it come to pass, said the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and them other beside the Ammonites, they come to Jehoshaphat to battle they hated each other. And it wasn't a matter back then that you just got captured or you surrendered, but they were brutal in this time that when they come in, if you lost, if you were lucky enough to be taken as a survivor or a slave, that's what you were, a slave, but normally they would just behead everybody or you were just wiped out utterly. Everything, they would tell you, you became a slave. Verse two, it says, beyond the sea from this side of Syria, and behold, they're in Hazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. Now, this was the most terrible news a leader could get right now. This, this would be akin to if we were in the building and someone come in and told Mike that all of Asheboro had turned against us and they were out there and they wanted to wipe us out for no reason at all, other than just to wipe us out. We'd be a small amount here. And they were facing, this was an impossible situation impossible odds. Verse 3. And said, Jehoshaphat feared and sent him to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Now, I was blessed when my grandfather passed away. He gave me a lexicon that was written in Hebrew and translated to English. And the Hebrew word here, fear, was the most violent, most terrible to the core news you could receive. When they used this word in Hebrew, this particular word, that meant you were rocked to your soul. Now put yourself in their place. You were rocked literally to your soul. I don't know what's going to happen. It was a point of where you felt hopeless. This is what we want to address today, hopeless. It said, Jehoshaphat feared and proclaimed a fast. Now, in verse 4, it says, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah that came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, our God fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rules not over the, all the kingdom of the heathen? In thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee. Now, he wanted to build everybody up. So in verse 7, he said, Are not thou our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham forever? Now he's claiming these promises of God. And they dwelt therein and built thee a sanctuary for the name, saying, 
And he, this is a promise that come out of 1 Kings 8. And I want you to look and see what he did. The original promise, God told him, said, if evil comes upon us as a sword, judgment, pestilence. But Jehoshaphat, because he was shook to his very core, he said, if, no, wait, when evil comes upon us. We were in the present now. When evil comes upon us as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and crying to thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. He stood right up and told the people, proclaim the fast. He said, here's the scripture. I want to tell you about it. It's no longer if. It's become reality now. When? It has come to reality. So now, okay, the rubber has met the road. Everybody realizes now, Jehoshaphat, for him at this time to speak to his people, Jehoshaphat was kind of a rock star back then. All the kings before him, even his own mother, had built idols and had built places of worship to idols, and he had tore all those down. And he was trying to be a good, godly king. And so he had taken away all the things in Jerusalem that had concerned the idols. So the people, when they stood up and he made this proclamation to them, they're like, this must be serious for Jehoshaphat to stand and be afraid and to claim this scripture. It said, and verse 10 says, And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they come out of the land of Egypt, but they turn from them and destroy them not. Verse 11 says, Behold, I say now, how they reward us to come cast us out of that possession which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, verse 12, would thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither we know what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. There's two things right here. We don't know what to do. And we don't have any might. What are we going to do? And verse 13 says, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. But, now here's where a commercial comes in. Now, they needed something from God. But it was more than just a man of power standing up and telling them. But what they needed was they needed a man of God. Now, we all need a man of God. And if you don't know one, I can introduce you to one on the front row here. But we need a man of God. And it says in Ephesians 4, 11, 12, and it says, and he gave some apostles, talking about God, he gave to some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what? The perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, right here, God needed to intercede, and they needed to hear from a man of God. Now, it's easy for us to say when we're in this type of situation, I'll read some scriptures. Your uncle can call you and read one to you. But until you have a man of God break down the word of God and you can mix that with your faith, then that's when we can start to build blocks to overcoming impossible situations. So it, it's biblically correct that we have to have a man of God. Now this sounds like, well, you're doing a commercial for me. Oh my, yes I am. I'm doing a commercial for any pastor. We have to come. We have to have a local assembly. We have to have a storehouse. And there is a man there ordained of God to speak the word of God, to bring you the word of God. And it's biblical. We need preachers. Jesus was a preacher. We need preachers. We need that word of God preached to us so we can put it inside of us because we can't always just make it on our own. Most of the time, all of us, if we're left to our own, we won't study, pray, and fast like we should. But we need a man from God to preach us the word of God and bring it to us. St. Chronicles 20, 14. It says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeriel, and the son of Matiah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Here the son of the, the preacher steps up. And then he tells him in verse 15, says, Hearken ye all Judah, 
and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you. Here comes the word of God from the preacher. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow you'll go down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerome. Now let me tell you something about this. I love to study history, and I like military history, and I read a lot about this. This is not included in the Bible, but the cliff of Ziz at this time was a huge rock, sheer rock wall that separated two planes. And many times throughout history when battles were taking place in the Middle East, one force would try to take control of Ziz because if you had control of Ziz, nobody could get to you. Even a small force could occupy Ziz and nobody could touch you until your supplies ran out. So all the people in the congregation, when the preacher said, Okay, tomorrow you're going to go down to them. And they're up by the cliff to Ziz. Everybody knew at that time, wait a minute. That's impossible. They're between us and the rock. Think about that a second. What's between us and the rock? These people didn't know what to do. Wait, but that's just a, that'll be a slaughter. And we'll find them there before the wilderness. Wait a second. And so at that time, the people were thinking, why would we go someplace that would be, we can't, we can't do anything with that. Sometimes we do the same thing. We think, well, I want to overcome this situation, but what's between us and our rock, our cliff, our stronghold? What keeps us from getting into our stronghold? So verse 17 says, but you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow you'll go out before them, for the Lord will be with you. In verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Verse 19, And the Levites... And the children of the Korathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Now, the preacher just told them, you're going to walk in on these folks and you're going to win. He didn't tell them, gather up 10 men and attack from the north, and 20 from the south, circle around them or anything. He just said, no, you're going on in in this battle is God's. Now this is another part of overcoming these impossible situations is we have to put our trust into God. If we second guess God and say, well, I'll do this to make it happen. I'll do this to make it happen. What we have to do sometimes is just say, no, I just have to walk in on faith on what I know, what I've heard, what I've been taught, what I've read, what I've prayed, what I've fasted, what I've put into it. I have to go out and step out on faith and believe that God will deliver us from this. I copied down uh, Acts 14 and 8. It said, There said a certain man of Lystra, important in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, and never had walked. And the same had heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceived he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now, the, per the reason I wrote this scripture down was, in 14 and 9, it said, Paul perceived he had the faith to be healed. Now, how did Paul perceive it? God didn't whisper in his ear or what anything. He perceived it because he seen that the man was receiving what he was preaching. He had heard the promises. He had heard what Jesus had done. He had already seen what the scriptures had said and prophesied about him. And he had heard Paul preaching. So he mixed all that together and Paul seen, ah, I perceive he's got the faith to be healed. He was responding to the word of God. He responded to it. And so he told him to stand up and be healed. 
because he was responding to the word of God. So verse 21 said, then back to Jehoshaphat, said when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 22, it says, and when they began to sing and praise, they hadn't even had their promise met yet. They still had impossible situations. They didn't know if it was life or death. All they were acting on is what the word of God told them, go out and meet them. Go out and meet them in another impossible situation. But it says, then they began to sing and praise. And while they were singing and praising, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which had come up against Judah. And they were all smitten. They turned against themselves and destroyed themselves. While everybody else was singing and dancing. While everybody else was rejoicing in the fact that the situation was done. While everybody else was saying, God is a deliverer. God can do this. Yet even though it was impossible, and back in this time, they were facing death. But no matter what, they were rejoicing and singing, just like we were doing this morning, rejoicing and singing. And there might be people here that have problems in your lives. But rejoice and sing. Because while you're doing that, God is working. God is doing things for us. Verse 23, For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they made it into the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And that's just how it is with worldly things. You usually they end up, everyone in, ends up eating each other and destroying each other. And it comes to an end. And then what happens? God stands above it all. The things of here are temporal, but God stands above it all. Verse 24, it says, When Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked at the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, none had escaped. Now, wouldn't that be something if you just had a handful of people compared to two complete nations come against you, and you have a handful of people, don't know what to do, and you step up on the scene and wait. Everybody's dead. All I did was sing. All I did was praise. All I did was worship. All I did was listen to the word of God and believed what God told me. That's all I did. That's all I had to do. But sometimes that's our biggest barrier. But these people accepted it and said, look, there's nobody to fight. God already had won the battle for them. 25, when Jehoshaphat and his people come to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, and more they could carry away, for they were three days in gathering up the spoil that was so much. And then on verse 26, it says, On the fourth day they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah, and there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of the same place was called the Valley of Barakah to this day, which Barakah in Jewish means blessing. Blessings. Like some up on this dead army and they were blessed, not only with just their lives, but it said with riches so much, it took them days to carry it back. Sometimes God, that's the way he'll bless us. We'll look at a hopeless situation, but he'll bless us in so many ways that we'll think, wait a minute, how could God give me all this? How could he do it? Trust and believe and sing and pray and worship. And 27 says, And they returned every man of Judah, Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat to the forefront of them to go again. To Jerusalem for joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over all their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. Now they really had something to sing about. Before they were singing and praising on faith. Now they were singing and praising on experience. And the fear of God was on all the kingdom of those countries when they heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. Do you realize this is a testimony unto us that when we face those things down, the people will look at us and say, 
Well, I seen so and so overcome that. I seen just like the gentleman I told you about laying there in his bed, he passed away, but he overcome the fear. He overcome the disappointment. And he held my hand and said, There's a promise waiting for you. It doesn't mean it's always unto death. But to that point, to that point to this day, the people that were around him, the people that served him there, they, they would say to you, if you went there to this day, they would say, I remember Bob Mender. <laughs> it's a it's a touchstone for me too. I'll never forget him. They'll say that man had faith like you never seen. That man touched me with his faith, even to the point of death. Psalms 91 and 14 says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him up on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I wrote down impossible situation. Pray, read the word, come to church, listen to the preacher. Remove what stands between you and your rock, the fortress you need. And it's no longer possible. It's victory. Sometimes we're in our own ways. We need to get ourselves out of our own way. Sometimes what we need to do is just pray and accept what God's word says. Yes. And just take it for what it is. Sometimes that's all we have. Even when we fail God, or we fall down, or we fail others, or even when we feel like I'm the most worthless person God has. If we're a believer in Him, that's all we have. That's all we need. That's all we need. It's as long as we've got God, as long as we've got Jesus Christ, that's all we need. No matter what happens, we still have promises. We still have hopes. We still have dreams. Everything he gives to us. If we just say, that's all I've got is him. Jesus Christ. That's all we need. If it looks impossible, there's a formula here out of Second Chronicles, what they did with victory. Hold to that promise. Hold to it. Let it work in our lives. I think churches nowadays, I believe there are a lot of churches that they just they fall into a routine. And they don't allow these things to work in their lives. But I know why. It'd be great if we could see victory happen in the church. Not just outward things, but inward things. Finding things, well, your faith grows. Or power of prayer grows. Or we see people come in that you never thought would be saved. Because that's the end result right there. Or that your walk gets deeper with God. There's so many things that talks about in the Bible about the, the blessings and the riches and the fullness of God. It's all available to us, but we get in our own way. We get between our rock. But if we get out of the way, then we can go to that rock. And we build ourselves up by prayer, fasting, reading his word, coming to church, hearing his word. We need each other. We need each other. I need all of you all. Mike needs all of you all. Everybody here, we all need each other to stand strong together. And it's no longer possible. It's possible to us. That's what we need to do is bind together. Not see things as impossible, but see them as possible. But with God, anything is possible. Yeah. Let's all pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for your love and mercy and your grace. And we're thankful, Lord, for the word of God. We're thankful, God, that we are able to take you at your word. Lord, we're thankful that we can see impossible things turn into possibilities. 
Father, I ask that you speak to every heart here today and the word of the Spirit. Speak to each and every soul here. And anybody here does not know you, God, we ask that you would just go ahead and speak to them and bring them to you, God. And for all the others, Lord, the ones that do know you, God, we just ask that we could get the barriers out of our own ways. And Lord, that we just trust in your word and believe and go ahead and give you the glory and the honor. God, we realize that there's only one thing each and every person here needs, and that's you in your life. We thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for everything you do for us each and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Lord. Um... Man, that was awesome. You know, one of the things that he talked about at the very end is victory. And, and that the victory that we have in Christ. Um, and just last week, I want to remind you of the victory that we saw last week and what God is doing. We saw nine people be baptized last week. That's victory. That's God getting the honor and the glory. And we're excited to see what God has in store for all of us. Um, in just a moment, we're going to sing one more song. We're also going to take our offering. Our offering is an opportunity for us to give back to God what he has richly blessed us with. Um, and so if you're a guest, if you're a visitor, if you're still trying to figure this thing out, uh, we don't want you to feel obligated um, to give. But this is this is an opportunity for us who call Renew Home um, to give back to the house of God. And so will you stand as we sing one last song?
spoke to my Michael's fire. We hope it spoke to everyone else this morning, too. Um, we have just a few announcements. If you are a first-time guest, there should be a connection card somewhere on one of the chairs around you. If you don't mind filling that out, we would love to meet you and give you a gift. You can hand it to Michael and I on your way out. Um, also, we have a connected class. If you're interested in learning how to get involved in the life of the church and become a member of the A-Team, um, we have a class every third Sunday of the month at following service, so you can go online to register at renewashbury.com slash getconnected. Um, we would love to talk to you, or if you just want to come and talk to us or fill out on the connection card as well. Um, and Santa and Mrs. Claus are going to be coming to visit on December the 11th, so a couple of weeks. So after service, um, we're going to have them out here in the lobby area. They're going to read a Christmas story, and then we'll have free photos with the kids. So please bring your kids out. It's going to be just an incredible fun day. So um, thank you guys so much for being here. We love you guys, and hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.